Um, all right, welcome to SIGOTH for May 27th. Let me go ahead and uh, present the agenda. Um, all right, let's get started. Um, so uh, pull of note, um, I shared this uh, a couple months ago, um, the uh, sort of proposal around a pod security standards um, and the PR has merged. Uh, it's now part of the Kubernetes documentation, um, sort of laying out these three recommended policy levels um, I noticed yesterday that uh, there's a couple of restrictions that are missing, um, and so I'll go ahead and add those soon. Um, but uh, if you have more thoughts on this, um, uh, take a look. Uh, and yeah, right now it's um, just a, a documentation page, um, and we'll be kind of adding to it and evolving it as, uh, as needed. Um, any questions about that before I move on? Do we have a recommendation for people who are going to be um, sort of implementing uh, enforcers for these to subscribe to or keep up with like how these recommendations evolve over time, especially around new capabilities? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, no is the answer, <laughs> um, but that's, that's a good idea. Um, uh, do you have any recommendations for how we might set that up? Um, I, I vaguely remember discussing sort of, uh, like a test suite type approach mm -hmm. to say like, um, if you have a restricted policy in place, these, these things should be able to be created and these things should not be able to be created um, mm -hmm. for each of the levels. Um, ha having a way to run that set of tests against an arbitrary uh, cluster with an arbitrary policy enforcement mechanism um, is really useful and that would let someone not just subscribe to a doc update but actually like run master yeah. versions of that and notice when like hey the restricted thing this this new thing came in and we decided like here's where it fits in this policy like i, I need to mm -hmm. um yeah that's a good idea um one other thing that just I didn't see noted here is that uh, pod security policy is beta with no current plans for promotion, uh, as far as I know. So mm -hmm. that seems worthy of noting here when it's um, being linked to and referenced. Um, yeah, I can I can add that um, those policies link through to the pod security policy documentation, which mentions that it's in beta, but not that we don't plan to move forward with it. Yeah, I, I think that's worth bubbling and making prominent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, I'll uh, follow up with this. Um, okay, uh, next up, um, API server uh, per request MTLS. Um, uh, who added this to the agenda? So uh, I added it. I'm Colton and I'm from Apple. I've got Bob on the, on, on the, on the call with me and uh, he's on our traffic team uh, and knows a lot about um, networks and authentication he does he works on a lot of the auth for our for our organization um uh it was a member of his team that discovered this that um 
basically the, and I think it, it was like intended to be this way. Um, I think that just the ramifications are at scale. We end up having a lot of useless work being done in the server because we can effectively use connections as that caching layer um, that as long as you have the connection open, you can trust the requests going over that connection because you've done the cert verification up front. Um, but that's not how it works today. The way it works today is you establish the connection without doing any MTLS. And then all the requests that are streamed through that single connection are doing the expensive CPU on the, well, to us, it was super expensive because we have really deep cert chains. Um, but at, at a lot, this basically becomes a bottleneck for the API server at like a really large scale for like a lot of pods or a, a dimension of a lot of cubelets. Um, because once you hit a certain amount of requests per second, you can end up with like a rolling death effect, um, where all of the API servers can't handle the requests, um, in time. And instead, if you just eat the cpu of the initial connection uh handshake and doing t the ntls there um we saw that uh, you can see in the graph below that i mean it, it got rid of the cpu problem on the api server so right now we have to carry the internal patch we'd love we what we'd love is to be able to just have an option to turn on this alternative way of doing the verification um, and the, like the caching with the connection instead of doing it um, on a per request basis. Um, but there's been a lot of debate about um, maybe just having a different Golang option. The problem is I think the, the Golang option for uh, verifying it if it's, if the cert's presented means that you still can bypass off giving like an unverified cert um, so I don't know how that how that passes the edge case of like let's say I give an invalid cert claiming who I am, then if the, if it's not done at that connection time, um, or if I don't give a oh I guess yeah I mean I haven't thought through that option too much but I mean the go the upstream golang change is just going to take a really long time and might not be accepted by the community I mean we can try to do it that way, um, but I think the easiest one for us at least and that made a lot of sense that like we could directly contribute to is the separate implementation that like i mean this is like we're a part of the division that's doing apple's like centralized infrastructure um and so this would be like a pretty well-trodden code path um that's like vetted by our security team and it's pretty important you know to like apple security um so I just mean it's not like it's not like it's a small, small team that's just like using this one um, implementation of auth. Like it, we would be contributing and maintaining it. Um, is what I just wanted to say, I guess. So uh, and like we uh, could implement number five, but it doesn't solve. Like that is just the worst implementation from our perspective. So like it doesn't. No one would use it really. Um, if we like implemented like doing caching in memory of the cert chain, the cert verification. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean no one would use it? Like we wouldn't use that. We would just carry the internal patch does a much better job of just addressing the, the problem. Like it doesn't require any additional memory usage or a cache or anything like it just um it, it it like uses it's effectively like not going to use any more memory than um, yeah so the the concern with um switching to the standard library verify on connection was um that it breaks clients that present right. client certs that are not intended for authentication to the api servers so that like going back whatever four or five years, like th those were the clients that prevented us from using the standard library method in the first place. Um, otherwise, yeah. 
we would have done that. <laughs> right. Cause um, they, they, they basically wanted to be able to do like, okay, I'm, I'm submitting an invalid cert, but really I'm trying to do token off, um, for example. Right. Or, or, or the client the right that, one. that, uh, present a client cert to all outgoing connections, regardless of the server. Like th oh, this right. is, this is my yeah. client cert that, that I use for like corporate proxy authentication or, like this, this asserts my identity and I need it for like some non-significant percentage of the network requests I make. And so I just, I spray it out like, to any connection I make um, indiscriminately. So the, the Go clients don't do that, but some, some clients do, but some browsers do. And uh, yeah, so um, I, th I think the, it, we try to avoid adding sort of alternate configuration paths that can't reasonably be enabled by default or broadly. Um, and so it's, this is the sort of thing, like, do you have clients making connections like this? It's hard to know until you <laughs> turn this until on turn and then on. discover, oh yeah, it turns out I did. And I just broke like X percent of my clients. Um, so, I, my ideal right. scenario would be if the standard library supported doing this, like by all means, verify the, the TLS connection at connection time. Right. But we'd like break, break the existing clients. I mean, so that's why, like, I mean, I, when I originally proposed the idea, I was like, I'm pretty sure, it, you know, it breaks assumptions that have been made around the server behavior. So we can't do it that way. I don't think, um, I mean, maybe, it, uh, I mean, I know that there's like, between certain major versions we can make breaking changes but this is breaking like so many clients and you know th third party integrations with, with kubernetes that like i think it would be a unfortunate thing to try to just upstream directly to the existing auth implementation um which is why i didn't propose that uh i didn't consider the like hesitation of of having it behind the flag um, because it, it, if it, if it has a big impact of, of breaking things that, um, that's like discouraged against, I was trying to think of examples where we have that today with certain feature flags. And I know there are some, but for all things, most of the feature flags that we put in place are expected to be temporary, like, and, and they gate behavior during development and testing and maturation of a feature, but then they're expected to graduate and be on by default and no longer have, you know, sort of doubling our test matrix um, long term. Right. Do you think uh, that the community would be against switching clients eventually over to um, like a per connection, like doing the TLS up front and providing the, either choosing to do cert authentication or I mean, I think you were talking about the f the fan out. Um, I think Bob, you you said that there's a way to address the the fan out issue, for, um, like when you're, bl like blindly sending certs to like multiple, or I think also um, Jordan, you brought up something about um, browsers forwarding, um, like certs blindly or something. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we wouldn't be able to, to change that behavior or address that that use case. So, yeah. So, I think the what most I, I mean, unless unless there's a way to separate the initial TLS authentication code path from the I have connected and now I am sending some other certificate uh, because that's what I do, but. I'm not quite sure I follow. Uh, like if we re-implemented enough of the standard library, we could we could do this in tree, but I would really like to avoid that. I, I think what Mo said kind of matches my thinking. Like I would like to see this option supported by the standard library. Um, so I would encourage requesting that. And uh, like if we get that from the standard library, that's great. Uh, until we do, um, it seems like the caching of saying like we, we saw this leak certificate that was verified in a handshake so we know you have a private key and we already verified the chain for that and remember like memorize that um 
uh, that seems like it would not be unreasonable and that would avoid giving us a, a configuration knob that we don't really want long term. Yeah, I don't want to uh, forego the um, expiry time validation um, in general. So we could either do like partial evaluation or just do like caching uh, per request. Um, if we had like a cache for one minute, I think that seems reasonable. Um, you can even pin the expiration to the date on the cert. So, yeah, you, you, you could, yeah. You, if you were caching it, you could still validate the, the expiry time. Validating the expiry time is cheap. It's, it's the public key math that's expensive. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I think um, I, don't, I wouldn't even care if we are doing revalidation every minute or so uh, using some expiring cache. So yeah, that would that would be my feedback. If if you wanted to contribute this and not carry a, a custom patch, so that seems like the best balance between keeping compatibility, but also hopefully unblocking expensive verifications, deep chains, uh, or big keys. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. as like a a, a middle ground for it. Um, okay. Okay, cool. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's always fun to see someone running into things and like paging in. Like, I, I remember running into this. Why, why did we do this? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's like probably been around since the beginning of it. So, um, yeah, super interesting. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, all right, uh, next up we have external TLS uh, certificate authenticator. Um, Kat, who yes, wants hi, to take so this one? I could take it. So hi, my name is Christian from Elasticis and uh, together with me on the call should be also Jakub. Yep, he's here. And we have been working, uh, we have been contracted, just to give a bit of a history to this project, we have been contracted to uh, implement uh, PKCS 11 standard in uh, Cube Control. So the client was asking us to comply to certain security requirements of theirs, which was to m avoid as much as possible to have any kind of soft tokens in their system. And in their opinion, things like, for example, TLS resume um, tickets or private keys, that is kind of how nowadays most of the people do authentication against uh, the Kubernetes API, are soft tokens. They would rather prefer this, this thing to be delegated to a hardware security module via a standard such as uh, PKCS 11. Now, we prepared a small presentation to follow up on this uh, enhancement. We also have a small demo. I'm not really sure how to make the best use of the time of this community. Um, we also got two new feedbacks shortly before this uh, this meeting, so I'm not sure what uh, what would you prefer. Would you like me to uh, go through the material we have so far and bring everybody on the same page um, so as to gather more feedback, or should we just dive directly in? Um, can you go through the presentation in about five minutes? Me, yep. I could do that. Uh, would you like me to share the screen? Um, yes. Uh, right, we should be able to share now. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, Right, you should be able to share now. Uh, does everybody see my screen now? No. Hmm. 
That's pretty disappointing. I keep clicking on the share button, nothing happens. Um, do you want to share, uh, can you link to the presentation from the uh, agenda and I can present it? Uh, I could do that Or is too. it more of a demo? Or? I, I have, uh, I think I would rather do the demo uh, in that case, but um, <laughs> we can also go through the presentation if for some reason sharing doesn't work right now. I added the link in the in the agenda. Can you access it? I requested access. Uh, just a second, I found a window that Zoom spawned somewhere and... Uh, okay. Do you now see my window? Yeah. <laughs> my screen. Great. Oh, okay. Apparently there was a window that I haven't noticed. Uh, let me then go to the demo because I find it pretty, um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, so the key recordings are pre-recorded, but the, um, the commands itself that are executed and the output is real. So like I said, um, let me just run this external plugin here. So I'm right now having a mini cube cluster uh, running on my laptop, pretty standard things. And the thing is that by default, the way clients are using um, Kubernetes, unless they're very knowledgeable, is that they have some kind of private certificate uh, somewhere most likely on their system. And I know that this is a bit of a controversial topic, whether you should use uh, OpenID or or well, you should avoid certificates at all or whether you should just go ahead and use OpenID. But at least all of us kind of seem to agree that at least in break glass scenarios, you do need private keys. And so, like I said, we're contracted to avoid these kind of uh, attacks where, for example, somebody would be able to uh, gain access to your private key by just uh, stealing your laptop and then doing a cold boot attack or something like that. And to this end, uh, we have used the hardware security module like the YubiKey, which is pretty popular. So you can either generate the, um, an RSA key on the YubiKey or you can just import a key onto it. So I'm going to do the latter right now. And then basically I can just uh, wipe my client key and my client certificate. Now, of course, I have lost uh, access to my Minikube cluster. So let me now reconfigure it. And this line is, let's say, the, the core of the contribution. So we basically added a new uh, authentication provider, which we call external signer, which gets as parameter a Unix socket, with which it talks to another process called external signer. So this is running right now in the lowermost terminal. And then all the other parameters are basically just sent directly to the external signer. Uh, we chose to do it so that uh, the user can potentially configure the external signer from their cube uh, config without having to spawn several executables for each kind of configuration. And so the idea is now, for example, yeah, this is the final result of how now the mini cube user is being configured. And if I now do cube control uh, pods, then here we still left a little bit of uh, verbose messages, but the idea is that the uh, external signer actually has the possibility of uh, giving a user prompt uh, to into the cube control to basically announce the user, hey, I'm waiting for you to touch the UB key or I'm waiting for you to type the password on some kind of external keyboard. So then that action would be very much depending on external plugin. And then type my super secure pin one, two, three, four, five, six. And it's afterwards uh, that the TLS handshake can complete and I can actually uh, look at yeah what's running in the Minikube cluster. So how many minutes do I still have? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, let me maybe skip ahead to this particular slide. But the thing is that we presented the first version of, um, of this contribution at SIGAUTH on March the 4th. At that time, we had a rather monolithic implementation where everything was, uh, was in kube control. And this, of course, was very problematic because it basically forced kube control to be compiled with CGO. This is required in order to use the PKCS 11 standard, since it's basically a protocol in which a dynamic library SO is being called via C-like interface. So then we um, worked on that a little bit. We proposed, we worked on a second version. Uh, which is the one that um, is right now contained in the, in the enhancements proposal. Uh, there we have two components. So the cube control is now having very, basically no extra dependencies and it's just talking to a, a Unix socket to an external binary, which is then um, using, um, yeah, containing all the, compiled with CGO and doing all the heavy lifting. This was then also problematic because uh, we were inspired heavily by the XSEC uh, credentials plugin. And apparently nowadays that is no longer favored because theoretically it would be possible for you to download a malicious cube control file from the internet. And so the community expressed the wish to reduce this kind of risk in the future. So then the demo that I have just presented to you and uh, the comments that we have left at the end of the cap is basically the third version of the implementation in which again, we have two components. So the cube control and the external signer, uh, they communicate via gRPC over, a, over Unix socket. So this can take advantage of the regular uh, protection mechanisms offered in uh, usual operating systems. And our understanding is that uh, the latest version of Go also supports Unix-like sockets on Windows. And uh, it also allows you to uh, send back to cube control prompts so that it's no longer in cube config that the pin is stored, or it's no longer cube control that intermediates the pin. There are also some hardware security modules that just don't, they have their own keyboard, for example, and they don't use the keyboard of the, of the host. So in any way, we feel that this is a pretty flexible solution that allows all kinds of future use cases for avoiding private keys in uh, cube control. And uh, this latest suggestion also has the advantage to, um, um, that it says the cluster name via gRPC. So you could also potentially not have any configuration in cube config and do the multiplexing and the matching between keys and the clusters in the external signer if anybody wishes to do so. So this is pretty much the architecture. Uh, when TLS setup is being done, first the certificate request is being sent uh, to the external uh, signer process and then later uh, during a TLS setup, a sign request is being sent again, which is handled by the external uh, signer. And uh, I think what's, what the critical point right now to discuss, at least for us, it feels, is if the API, so we're suggesting an API to communicate uh, between cube control and external signer. And we want to know if this is adequate or if, uh, if this still needs some work. We already have received just before, two hours before this call, some feedback. So I guess we will need to start by addressing that one. And afterwards, uh, we'd like to discuss, um, yeah, so we have received strong requirements to make this uh, contribution upstreamable. So we have missed, of course, the 1.19 deadline, but we are wondering like, do you see any major impediments or what, what should we else need to work on in order to have an alpha version aimed at Kubernetes 1.20? So um, I left a comment on the issue a while ago, but I didn't get a response. I think the big things for me are, I would really like to have the uh, clear requirements um, before we do this. Uh, and I don't have that clarity yet. Um, for example, like if you have very specific um, PCI, DSS, or whatever um, uh, NIST recommendations that we could look at to like rationalize these design choices against, um, that would be helpful uh, when reviewing the design. Um, so trying to understand, uh, I'd like to understand what uh, um, the, um, why your client uh, is requesting uh, this specific solution. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I'm also trying to figure out why this 
uh, looks um, so different than uh, FIDO, which seems like the prevailing standard for uh, user hardware backed login. So I can try to give, uh, so first of all, really sorry that I missed your comments. Uh, it's just that I mean that we have been working on so many other things that I uh, missed to. Yeah, no worries. We, we kind of, we, I feel that some of these we address them, but without really saying that we, <laughs> how we explicitly address them. Uh, but I, I can, I can maybe take down, scratch the surface right now. So uh, with respect to, you were asking this, uh, the question regarding the second factor is D by touch ID or YubiKey touch policy. Um, so right now, since there is a strong separation between cube control and external signer, this is really something that is the responsibility of the external signer. Uh, in the world of uh, YubiKeys, for example, or PKCS11, you can actually say that every single sign operation needs to be authenticated. So which means that every single sign operation needs a, a pin or it needs a touch or something like that. Or otherwise, um, you can also say that, well, you just authenticate once and then uh, you, can, you can, for a certain amount of time, um, do sign operations as you wish. I feel that currently with the, with the current architecture where you have a user prompt being sent back to cube control, we basically externalize this choice uh, to the external signer so that whatever regulations or whatever security policies uh, an organization has, they can be adapted to whatever is necessary. Um, do you think that that addresses your first uh, concern? Um, let me think. So I, I, I do understand that the model is more flexible uh, and I, I acknowledge that. Um, but that's where I think specific requirements uh, come in to uh, figure out whether the flexibility and uh, additional complexity justifies uh, or justifies the additional complexity. So, so yes, hy hypothetically, uh, this is definitely more flexible. Um, but yeah, I'd like to make this that concrete. But uh, what exactly would you say that the additional complexity consists in? Because strictly speaking, cube control, there is not that much that has changed in order to implement the external signer. Not that much. I, I, I'm not sure if I, I would buy that. So the additional complexity is adding the external signer and maintaining it over time. Uh, that's what I was referring to. It's also helpful to Versus. remember it doesn't just touch cube control, it touches client Go, which affects potentially all client Go consumers. And there are other consumers that make use of uh, aspects of the dialing and TLS verification and certificate, uh, the certificate callbacks and things like that. And so if we're talking about adding uh, authentication plugins to client go we have to consider what does that do to the surface area that lots of clients including the kubelet and the pi server and scheduler and control manager any client go consumer is going to be exposed to this complexity mm. so the way we currently implement is that the external signer is a separate um, authentication uh, plugin and basically all it needs is there's, there was already existing infrastructure in, uh, in client go uh, to hook the get cert method. And basically we're just hooking into that one. And instead of returning a real go um, signer, we're basically just returning proxy to a signer that is then being proxied by the Unix socket. So from our point of view, as long as you're not using the external signer authentication plugin, basically the data path is exactly the same. And then the, let's say, the magic only happens when you're explicitly using that kind of the, the external signer authentication plugin. Not, not sure if that uh, addresses your concerns. Um. So I, I think um, sell me on this over implementing uh, a ex exec plugin out of tree that uh, uses the FIDO standard. So I'm, I'm not really sure that they have the same um, 
that they still cover the same area because my understanding is that you know in case of hardware security module uh, the hardware security module is for example free to decide to to log each of the signature requests it's free to count the number of signature requests it's uh, it's free to for example display a led when a signature request is being done so in certain environments it's um, it can help a lot more on identifying potential intrusions and uh, things that go wrong whereas my understanding of how fido or other similar approaches work is that the tokens that they issue would be a lot longer lived i'm trying to find out the code in client code that actually changes yeah so um just for reference so the changes that we we did to client go per se are really just uh, captured in this in this screen so we're creating an auth provider tls interface that is extending auth provider with also the possibility of updating the transferred config and then if we notice that the auth provider actually implements this interface then we allow it to update the transport config so to to most of the users of client go this should be a pretty transparent change i would say Hello? Yeah, uh, I'm just uh, mulling it over. Um, th there is a, a non-zero cost. Um, and uh, for me, the requirements aren't uh, very precise yet, at least in my head. Um, maybe I miss those um, in the KEP, but I would really like um, specific uh, threat model or compliance standards that make uh, a FIDO-based approach um, not feasible. Uh, because I think in the long run, a FIDO-based approach is going to be easier to maintain for um, inside Kubernetes core. Um, OK. We'll We'll, we'll come up with some uh, scenarios and with concrete standards for that. Yeah, and, uh, I think there were other questions about um, whether we wanted a generic TLS offload for uh, clients um, or whether this was a specific integration for um, cube control. So this is a specific integration for kube control, uh, but that being said, uh, there is a similar effort, uh, kube KMS, which also wants to delegate encryption and decryption to some outside party. And this could be, of course, a hardware security module. I think that as adoption will grow larger, we will better understand. Um, I mean, there, there's no reason why this interface couldn't be used by other parts of kubelet or kube control as long as they need to retrieve a signature or, uh, sorry, to get the certificate and to use that certificate for signature. So I think the best path forward right now is to have people uh, review the KEP and get the eyes on it that you need. Um, I think uh, we'd like to hear from both David and Jordan on the KEP. Um, I will have a read, although I'll be honest, some of the abbreviations y'all have been using are not ones I am immediately familiar with. Uh, uh, no worries. Um, so if, if I you am calling you out for an authentication subproject. Okay. Uh, I can queue this up. Uh, I had not looked at it in detail yet since it wasn't targeting 119. Um, but if we want to set up a time, it might be helpful to uh, spend some time on this uh, together. I agree with David. I, I'm not as familiar with some of the, uh, the externalizable TLS stuff. So having 
uh, probably Mike there to explain things to me would be helpful. Um, we want to set that up uh, maybe sometime next week. Yeah, sometime between now and the. Yeah, given the enhancements uh, has already freezed for this release, uh, I don't think that there's a pressing urgency. Um, right. Mostly, I'm I'm wanting to be able to give crisp feedback so that mm -hmm. um, uh, the contributors can use the time between now and like the 120 deadline to uh, respond and update and make this a proposal that is better understood or more acceptable or we, we can just reach a conclusion. So yeah. I think having some feedback for them early uh, would be helpful. Yeah, uh, next week. Uh, that sounds good. Doable to me. Uh, I, yeah, next week, get up and we'll work out the calendars, Mike. Awesome. Um, this sounds good. Let's take the scheduling offline. Okay, so then um, we'll update the cap with uh, all the comments we have accumulated so far uh, until, yeah, the, hopefully until the end of this week or otherwise until the beginning of next week. So then you can schedule it and uh, yeah, we can discuss it together. Is, is, does that work? Sounds good. Um, and as questions are answered, um, please make sure that the answers um, are captured in the cap itself and not just in the, the comment stream mm -hmm. on the PR. Okay, thank you for all the feedback we got so far. Thank you. Um, all right, where's my window? Um, next up we have, uh, uh, next steps for managed CA bundles. Um, Jajka, are you on the call? Yeah. Yeah. So I could take some time to brief this. Um, hi, this is Jaji from Google. Um, so we uh, kind of announced this effort in last six us meeting to bring up some managed root CA bundle for the cluster level stuff. Uh, I wrote a small doc to summarize the different opinions and options in the original issue. Um, there was an original issue discussing about um, why do we need this um, and how we plan to do that. So um, in the doc, we do summarize some of the motivations and some um, options of doing that. So uh, I've heard like many people saying that they want some kind of basic mechanism to have a cluster level trusted uh, CA bundle. So they could have some uh, easy way to provide the certificate in the library. Um, in the considerations part, um, we have several options which uh, we don't have very strong preference. So we, I'd like to bring up here to hear more feedbacks to break the tie and kind of choose one of the options to start with some um, basic implementation or start design something. Um, so in terms of how do we um, inject the CA bundle, which is the primary design choice. We could use a projected volume to inject the certificate into the pod, or we could use a cluster config map. There are um, pros and cons of each option, but um, I couldn't tell like which option is better or which one is worse. So I would like to see more comments here. Um, yeah, there are some comments in the doc. People are looking at it, and some of them are like regarding to stability or uh, scalability, those stuff. But let's see whether people here have more 
So a question about this, right? Uh, I saw yeah. that it was initially focused on CA bundles and injecting them. It was less obvious to me um, how you were going to handle some of the mechanics around and what you intended, right? Is this going to be a way for the hosts running kubelets to have their system trust bundles changed? Or is this going to be something sort of unconditionally changing one of the base layers in an image, right? Are we gonna force add this to existing pods? Uh, or whether this was something that was gonna be related to being able to recognize, say, certain signers? Um, or whether it was going to support multiple routes of trust and whether it was intended solely for CAs or whether you saw this as a way to have sort of a global config map. Uh, and, and I didn't, I don't think, basically I started it and I had all those questions and I looked at it and I had like, ah. um, yeah. So um, we are thinking of like um, injecting some of the uh, very common trusted CA bundle into the images. Like we are not going to add the, the default like root CA stuff, but we are going to provide them as some extra like bundle stuff so that libraries could use these injected CA bundles to achieve some like stuff um we we could make it possible for like uh, uh cluster administrators to config some cluster level um ca bundles very easily like through some mechanism so like by default like the pods in this cluster would have these uh trusted ca bundles being distributed to the pods so yeah that's the initial thoughts. So, so is the stuff that you listed at the top where you were talking about admission registration and API registration that's not related to this proposal? It's, it's different than this proposal? So these stuff are uh, motivations like um... I guess I'm not clear on if you're if you're trying to change the set of trusted CAs inside of uh, of of pods running. Um, it's not obvious to me how that's related to things like admission and registration. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like uh, there are links to those um, issues. Like people from developing those stuff. They uh, express some interest. Like, if there is some mechanism to provide a Ruse bundle in the pod, uh, it will be easy for those webhooks API extensions to have. Like, currently they use some template, so they need to copy the certificate into each pod's config map. Uh, it's kind of like wasteful. Like, if we do have this mechanism, they could make. Yeah. Um. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I do think that it's an issue, um, the one that you have linked there for um, the uh, basically the API servers, um, CAs that it uses to trust webhooks. Um, I think that's a, a pretty different problem from injecting CAs into pods. Uh, and I, I think that's maybe what David was getting at. Mm -hmm. I, I think those are both issues that we want to discuss, um, and I, I think they should probably be addressed uh, independently. Okay. Yeah, I don't have an objection in concept. I mean, you can see we have a, yeah. a design about building uh, a way to have sort of the mm -hmm. idea of a global config map that a cluster op admin opts into. We were exploring the idea in OpenShift. It seems like a good idea. Uh, we were going to go down the CSI driver path for it. It's not like, hey, I want this design instead of what you have. Um, but if you're looking for like what other thoughts in the area look like, um, this is what those th 
thoughts. This is where we went and some of the reasons we did so. Uh, but we did try to separate out the concerns about trust for something like an admission webhook versus the how do I generally provide this piece of information uh, to, to any pod in my cluster. And it wasn't specific to CA bundles. Uh, and it was also explicit in what it did, right? There was there was a concept of an explicit opt-in or at least visibility that something like the root trust in your pod is not what you chose in your image. Um, because I think people really should be able to tell that they've been fiddled with. I see. And multiple chains of trust are important, right? Not all trust is the same. Yeah. And um, at the bottom part of the doc, we are still uh, not finalized how we deal with like cross bound, uh, cross OS, cross platform stuff. Like how do we inject this CI bundle into <coughs> images of different operating systems, different distributions? Like they um, search the default CA from different locations. Um, we are still thinking of how we deal with it. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of like I, yeah. So kind of like bring up this talk in the CCOS to uh, see like if people have more thoughts, like if so, like just comment in the talk we could see like people's thoughts and uh, improve our designs and break some times to uh, choose one of the options to start with implementation. Okay, I, I will take the time to certainly write up um, yeah. several of the questions. Um, yeah, don't, yeah. Uh, I guess several of the questions are somewhat fundamental. Um, yeah. So. All right. Thanks. Um, and just to address the kind of original agenda item of what the next steps are on this. Um, yeah, I think we should uh, kind of uh, iterate on uh, some comments on the doc um, to get some kind of basic understanding uh, in common. Um, and then the, the next step will certainly be uh, writing up a formal cap. Um, yep. But I think it's, it's okay to kind of answer some of the open questions on the doc first. Cool. Um, all right, uh, next up, um, I had added a um, agenda item about removing uh, the insecure port on the API server, which has been deprecated since uh, I think Kubernetes 1.10 um, and just says that it will be removed in some future release. Um, it, we attempted to remove it, uh, I think in 1.14 and that got reverted because it broke, um, I believe it broke COPS uh, due to an issue with um, a requirement for uh, insecure health Z checks, um, insecure meaning over HTTP. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm actually not sure if this is something that uh, is SIG auth or SIG API machinery's responsibility, um, but I would like to get a um, kind of a concrete deadline for removing that um, and a path forward. Um, and just to add a little motivation, um, uh, we've had some security issues in the past um, that uh, get escalated in severity because of the possibility of exposing the API server's insecure port. Um, so I'd like to 
remove the possibility for that escalation um, and also make it simpler to uh, score vulnerabilities that come in. Are you interested enough in doing it that we just say, gone? It's been deprecated <laughs> for quite some time. We could make the choice that, you know what? You knew it was coming. It, it happened in 115 before. It's been deprecated for many releases. It's just gone now. Uh, but I'm not sure what else you would have APM machinery do that would be different, right? Like what, what additional choice do we have? Um, yeah, I guess um, the, the, uh, <clears throat> so right now, if you have a load balancer or monitoring tool that doesn't have the ability to take credentials, it basically expects a unsecured monitoring endpoint. The only way to enable that is to either run it over localhost against the unsecured port or to enable anonymous requests. And so- That's uh, not entirely true. We do this for GCP by creating a, an HTTP proxy that only handles one endpoint with a credential that only has access to a single uh, ready endpoint, right? I think there's other options. Yeah. I agree. Okay, I, I'm not as familiar with using a proxy to add in authentication. To it's, it's not, I guess it's not even a proxy. It's just a thing that reads, it has credentials to read nothing but health, and then it exposes itself as HTTP and you just run both. Okay. And it can even listen on the same local host port uh, and be kind of transparent to things that are using that. So other yeah. options do exist, but they are work for other people but I don't think there's anything I, magic that API machinery can do. That... I think adding those, adding descriptions of those to this issue would, like laying out the options, uh, make it clear, like here's what you can do today without doing any work yourself. Um, if you don't want to do that, here are other options you could do with work to get the network properties you want. Um, yeah, so, and that might even be worth docu actually documenting. Like, you know, how, mm -hmm. how do you how do you monitor your server? Here are your options: turn on anonymous requests, and you can hit the health Z endpoint, or uh, set up something like this. And an example. Yeah, um, I can take that action item. Um, I guess the other possibility is um, several components, including Kubelet and Cube Controller Manager, um, explicitly have an option for a health Z port, um, which is just exposing a HTTP health Z endpoint. Um, so uh, we could consider adding that to the API server. Uh, I'm not super excited about that. I mean, I'm not super excited about having it on the binaries we have it on either. <laughs> uh, why not? Uh, it adds complexity in the code path to actually start it. It gives you an endpoint that is not secured and protected by credentials. Uh, and now that those binaries do have uh, authentication and authorization built in that matches the in cluster versions, uh, I don't, mm -hmm see a reason to have it. Basically, we have it because it existed long before. And mm -hmm. if we had had security on those initially, we would never have had separate ports. Um, okay. Um, Micah, I see that you're plus one for a separate health C port. Um, do you care to yeah, this is something, yeah, this is, I mean, so today, like we rely, I mean, this is just because we did this initially and we haven't really cleaned it up, but initially, like we rely on the system public uh, viewer, public info viewer um, for like, for health checks. 
And um, so it becomes a problem when people try to remove that. Um, so it's just a separate health, health Z port that you know wasn't exposed to necessarily the internet, but that just that we could use for health checking without having to worry about enforcing like uh, authentication authorization around um, would be really nice. I actually just had a, it, this issue come up in a, a document I was looking at earlier today. Ed, but you do see how you can build one, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it, but like just having to, having to, inf like today we don't, we're, we're fairly unopinionated about what is inside the cluster, like um, in terms of RBAC roles or, um, uh, you know, whatever, like we don't, for the most part, we don't prevent you from doing anything um, except for this one RBAC role of the system public info viewer because we're, we're using, we're relying on that for, for health checks. Um, and so, you know, ha having to maintain like an RBAC role for, for, for something to, to access or proxy healthy is just, I don't know, it, it's more work than just saying, okay, here's this, this additional port we'll listen on and the internet's going to not access it. It's just for like load balancer health checks or whatever. Um, that would be a lot simpler for us. Um, I'm going to pause you there because uh, I realize we're over time. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I will file a issue to track the removal um, of the insecure port, um, and then we can kind of follow up on that with some of the options. Um, as a straw man, I propose that we set a deadline of removing it in 1.20, uh, uh, which kind of gives us a release to figure out the other options um, and also give people a heads up that this is coming. I guess I'd um, say no again, later than 120. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, I'll file that issue and we can follow up there. Um, all right. Thanks everyone. Sorry for running over.